So I want to finish up kind of two topics before lunch, and that is, what is a, is, is there, if I have individual fitness data, and in several populations, for example, how can I put some indication on which population is under more selection? If I have individual fitness data, does that tell me anything about possible constraints on which traits can change or not change? And the answer is yes, we can use variance in individual fitness to answer both those questions. Then I want to basically also then talk about measures of sexual selection, because this is a topic that people get very excited about. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of heat and uh, a bit of smoke, so I want to try to clarify that. So the question then becomes, how do we compare the amount of selection acting on different populations? A perfectly reasonable question. For example, you've got the same species, you've got it in a climate-stressed environment, maybe on a, a, a margin of a population where the climate change is more extreme, and you have it in the central population. We, is one of those experiencing more, more selection than the other? Well, one way you could do that is you could use the selection intensity. And the intensity is simply, remember, S is the within generation change. So what I do is I measure a, a trait, I measure it before an episode of selection, I get an overall value. Then I measure it after selection. Suppose it's simply viability and these individuals live. So I take the mean here and compare that with the mean of everyone, and that gives me my within generation change S. Yes. If I write that in phenotypic standard deviations, that gives me a selection intensity. And that's a way of comparing selection on a particular character across populations. The problem is it's character specific. You want to measure that's character independent. The other issue is I could have lots of selection occurring without the mean changing. So I have two populations. One's under extremely tight stabilizing selection. So you move a little bit away from the mean, your fitness goes way off. The other's under much broader stabilizing selection. If both populations are sitting at the population mean, my I here would be zero for both of them. So this is not a good measure because it's character specific. It also doesn't capture, this is some looking at changes in the mean. So is there some measure, if I have individual fitness data from a couple of populations, that I can compare the strength of selection? And the answer is yes, and that measure is something called I, the opportunity for selection. And it's simply the variance in relative fitness. So I have individual fitness data from over here. I can compute the mean on that individual fitness data. I then standardize that by the overall mean squared, or I take this data here, I divide by the overall mean to standardize it and take the variance, exactly the same thing. So here's your sample estimate of that. This was first introduced by Jim Crow, who called the index of total selection, and Arnold and Wade, this very influential set of papers, were the ones that called it opportunity for selection, and talk about a lot of its features. One nice thing is that I bounds the maximal possible selection intensity. So if you know the opportunity for selection, no matter what the character is, I can give you a bound. The character won't change by more than this amount. So we'll talk about those features. First of all, here's Jim Crow. Um, there's Crow, there's Fisher, there's Kimura, sort of the three most famous population genesis of the uh, 1900s. Cabrera was Crow's student. Um, Jim was an accomplished musician. I think he was second chair violin in the Wisconsin Symphony Orchestra. And this is kind of the classic book on population genetics by Crow and Cabrera. came out in 1970. There are other books that are out now. For example, War and Humans is a nice book uh, for mathematical population genetics, which focuses more on molecular stuff. But this is still a classic and still quite relevant today. So Crow is a, is a dominating figure in population genetics and in large part because he had so many students. Um, he was also one of the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. So Crow was the one that came up with this notion of the index of total selection, and one of his motivations for it was the following. Suppose we assume, hypothetically, <clears throat> that fitness is perfectly heritable. If that's the case then, then I gives you the expected change in fitness. And he got that result, uh, as follows. This, we'll talk about this in a little bit. This is called the Robertson-Price identity, and it says you can write the within-generation change 
simply as the covariance between trait value and relative fitness. So let's not worry where that comes from. We'll see that in a little bit. If I ask about what the change in fitness is, if I assume heritability is one, just as becomes the selection differential on fitness, you write what that is. Character here is total fitness with respect to relative. You standardize that, and you basically end up getting this expression here. So that, that if fitness had a heritability of one, hypothetically, of course it doesn't, then the nice thing about the opportunity for selection would give you the expected change in fitness. That was um, the motivation that Crow used for that. One of the nice features about it is it allows me to compare different populations. Population one on the margin of a species range, population two in the center of the species range, who's experiencing more selection independent of any characters. I measure at the same, at comparable stages, intensities, uh, relative fitnesses from samples of those two populations. I compute the variance in relative fitness and the population with the larger variance in relative fitness has a greater opportunity to experience more selection. Now, all that noise could simply be uh, uh, random noise in the following sense. Suppose my only character is viability. If my chance to survive is 50%, half the time I survive, half the time I don't, that generates a certain variance around me. If my survival probability is 60%, that generates a smaller variance than 50%, because the variance is P1 minus P. So just because I have a variance in fitness doesn't mean that there's selection going on, because it could be that no matter what your trait value is, your expected fitness is the same, but there's a variance in that because of the sampling process. So variance in fitness doesn't imply that selection is acting on traits, but rather a variance in fitness gives you the upper limit that a trait can move. And the argument for that, given by Landy and Wade, uh, Arnold and Wade, is very straightforward. Let's look at the correlation between fitness and phenotype. So the correlation between fitness and phenotype, what is the correlation? It's the covariance divided by the square root of both variances. This covariance here, that's the Robertson price at any, which we'll talk about in a bit. That's just S to within generation change. This down here, the square root of the variance in relative fitness is just the square root of I. That is simply the selection intensity. So the selection intensity for any trait is always bounded above by the square root of the opportunity for selection. And that kind of makes sense. If you have a big variance in fitness, then some traits might move quite a bit if they're highly correlated with fitness. If you have a small variance in fitness, then no matter how correlated you are, traits aren't going to move very much. So the opportunity for selection is nice because it gives you a character independent way to compare populations. And it also bounds the expected within generation change in the mean for any character you look at. So it's a nice general measure. And again, it's based entirely on Estimating individual fitness, and by the way, you can do this for fitness components. The book talks about how you partition over fitness components. You can do this for an episode of uh, fitness or total fitness, but it's completely independent of characters. And that basically, if I take the bullfrog data from example one, there the relative fitness is uh, the total relative fitness. There's the variance in relative fitness is 0.62. If I then basically compute uh, the square root of that, it means that the selection intensity for any trait in this data can be no more than 0.8 in absolute value, and you compute what it actually is, and it turns out to be about 0.14. So the bottom line is, if I have estimates of individual fitness, I can compare strength of selection across populations, and I can bound the within generation change you're going to see in any particular population. So here's a way to think about that. The histogram, over, this is the same fitness data. The histogram over here is the same in both these cases. This is character one, character two, because I'm measuring the same individuals. So this variance here stays the same. What changes here is so the height of these points never changes. What changes is how I slide them back and forth. If you actually look at individual points, you'll see that here. There's no correlation between relative fitness and the trait. So this opportunity for selection goes unrealized. 
here, there's a rather tight correlation. So the trait value is going to increase because larger trait values give you higher relative fitness. But the key is, in both cases, uh, the opportunity for selection is the same. It's just that in this case, the trait is associated with fitness, and some of that opportunity is realized. In the second case, it's not. And in the extreme, basically, you can ask how much of that opportunity is realized. There's the opportunity, and then the correlation between your trait and fitness is what tells you what fraction of that opportunity is realized. If that correlation is small, you can have a large opportunity, but you'll only get a small change. If that correlation is large, most of the change you'll see matches the square root of the opportunity for selection. So one more thing, and I'll see, oh, here, question, huh? Opportunity for selection on fitness? Sure, so, any, so basically, for any trait, it bounds it. So the most fitness can change, that's, the, that's Crow's definition. So the most fitness can change if the heritability is one, the most fitness, relative fitness can change by an Indian generation is on. And that, that's the bounding principle. Yeah. So any character, and fitness is a character. Yes. Sure. No, I see your point. And what, what, the reason I'm, I'm cutting you off a little bit is don't get hung up on heritability one. The reason Crow introduced this is to say what would be the maximal response you could get in fitness. And the maximal response occurs when heritability is, in fitness is one. That's never the case. Heritability in fitness is almost very close to zero. So the, the motivation for opportunity for selection would simply be the maximal amount that fitness could change if it was totally heritable. It's not, so you only capture a fraction of it. And the more important thing for our purpose is for any particular character, you can basically bound what the within generation standardized change is going to be. That's the key point that, that it's made. Don't. Because it's not, it's not, it's not relevant to this discussion. So what is relevant to this discussion is number one, what's the maximal change you can have in fitness? That happened if heritability is one, there's the maximal change in relative fitness. Number two, what's the maximal change you can have in any particular character? It's bounded by this, and what fraction you see, how much of that change is realized depends upon the correlation between your character and fitness. So this gives the connection between specific characters Variation in fit, so the change in the specific character, variation in fitness, and the correlation between the character and fitness. But the point is, don't don't think about this as an operational device. Think about this as something that gives you bounds. I'm comparing two populations. I'm asking if I can bound a trait in. So oftentimes we don't have le a data that that are. Um, so here I've got. Individual fitness measurements on everyone. Let me give you another type of data you can have. This is the meadow brown butterfly. And this individual has two eye spots on the hind wing. There's so few butterfly species in England that all of them are really well studied. I mean, it really sucks to be from a really depauper area, but the good news is it means they're well known. So people do a lot of work on the meadow brown because it's pretty. And, and it also shows variation in eye spot numbers. So a really interesting data set is the following. If I go in the field and I get a sample of females, here's the distribution for 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 eye spots. If I take a number of females at random and in the lab, and presumably under similar environmental conditions, that's an assumption, let's assume that's the case, then rear individuals and look at the individuals that hatch, I see this distribution of eye spots. So this distribution is somehow perturbed in the field. And one way to think about that is if PI is the frequency before selection and PI prime is the frequency after selection, the ratio of those two is your relative fitness. So individuals 
with eye spot number of zero have higher fitness, and as you get more and more eye spots, you get lower and lower fitness. So this is actual data where by using this comparison, you can ask about the fitness of a particular trait. And here, I've got these features here. So you might ask, okay, can I get an opportunity for selection from this data? And the problem is you can get a lower bound. And the reason you can get a lower bound is what you can say is that the among character variants, you can compute using these. But the opportunity for selection isn't the among character variants. It's among plus one, it's the total variance. So basically, you use this data to compute opportunity for selection. There's the value you get. And all you can say is the opportunity is bigger than that because this is an estimate based upon fitness variance over different classes. But I also need the variation within the classes to compute that. So for example, if this, let's say, is survival ship, if that's the mean survival ship, then the variance within the class is P1 minus P. So 0.8 times 0.1. So if you've got discrete data, not on individuals, but rather on the, the, expected the expected fitness in different character states, you can put a lower bound on the opportunity for selection, but you can't say actually what it is. Lower bound's useful, but it's, it's, you, you can't exactly say what it is. So in your fitness data basically is broken up into mean fitness values for specific character states, you can partially estimate the opportunity for selection. The opportunity for selection assumes you know individual fitness. So this is simply looking at the between trait differences and fitnesses. You also have to know the within trait differences and fitnesses for particular situations. So that's the opportunity for selection. So we'll give some more examples for questions about that. So you can imagine how things might change. So one interesting thing is correcting lifetime reproductive success for random offspring mortality. So suppose, for example, that you have an episode of selection and the mean family size before the episode is mu and the variance is sigma squared one. If that uh, uh, selection is entirely random, what do I mean by entirely random? Every phenotype has the same fitness. But remember, you survive or don't survive. There's a random component in that. And surviving or not surviving, that is not selection. What is selection is if there's variation among the intrinsic ability to survive. That's what generates variation in fitness is what generates uh, selection that can act in evolution. So if I simply have offspring that die at random, independent of their trait values, it's going to inflate the opportunity for selection, and you can make a correction here for what that should be. So basically, this correction here allows you to say that if you've got, you measure individuals, and then you have, let's say you measure individuals at fledgling, and then after that there's loss of individuals, but it's entirely random, then the opportunity for selection when you measure it at the next stage is a function of the survival ship, and S is the chance they survive. So if the survival is very high, the opportunities don't change much. If the survival is low, the opportunities can change dramatically. And mu is basically the, what is mu? The, uh, uh, the mean family size. So if the mean family size is small and the, the survival ship is low, random mortality will inflate the opportunity for selection from one episode to the next. So what does that mean? So people uh, did this, a couple of workers, and what they noticed was they uh, took a data set for bird species where they measured foot, uh, uh, fitness as number of fledglings. Um, and what they noticed was about 45% of the variance in here could simply be accounted for by this random mortality term. Remember, a fitness is an expected survival ship. If you think of it that way, just worry about viability selection. So this is an expected value. It's a Bernoulli value. You either survive or don't. There's randomness about that. That randomness will give you variation and inflate that. So what you can basically ask then is if you observe 
a, a certain variance over a period of time, you know, survival ship and mean family member, you can ask what fraction of that variance is random. And in a lot of cases, a lot of that variance you see has a random component. So I just want to call that to your attention. Again, it's one of many details. It's something you should have in the back of your mind. If you worry about it, you can go ahead and look in the book and it talks about the correction. So what are some of the caveats in using the opportunity for selection? Because it seems like it's a pretty good measure. It's character independent. It seems to have some nice features. Well, that's true, but with any measure, you need to be a little bit careful. So number one is you have to, if I'm comparing fitness over populations, you've got to have consistent measures of fitness. So if in population one, I'm measuring number of mates, in population two, I'm measuring lifetime reproductive successes, those are different fitness components. Lifetime reproductive success is going to have a larger variance. Why? Because it includes variance in mating as one component and the number of offspring as a second. So when you're comparing opportunity for selection across characters or across populations, you've got to use the same measurements of fitness. Otherwise, the, uh, the, the uh, comparisons aren't consistent. That's kind of straightforward. The next thing is opportunity for selection uh, can be problematic in the following sense. Suppose I'm looking at a small time window and looking at number of meetings or looking at um, survival. And in a time window, you either mate or don't mate. So what's the opportunity for selection? Well, in that case, if P is the probability of mating, 1 minus P is the probability of not mating, you can then go ahead and figure out the mean fitness is P, so square that is P squared, there's the variance. So basically, the opting for selection is 1 over P. What does that mean? It means if I have a really tiny window, so only a tiny fraction of individuals mate, the fraction mating P is going to be tiny, my opting for selection will be big. So as I run time over more, so more individuals have a chance to mate, P becomes larger, and my opportunity for selection becomes less. With viability, it's the opposite. P is the chance you survive. If you look at a narrow window, most people survive. I is small. As that window gets larger and larger and larger, P gets smaller and I gets bigger. So here's an example of that. These are chorid bugs. This isn't the same species, but it gives you a colorful example of some of the bugs. And what you basically see here is this is, I mean, how exciting is your job as a field biologist when you can watch mating bugs over an 80-day period? I mean, it doesn't get more interesting than that, right? So what they basically showed here, this is the total opportunity for selection at the end of the experiment. If you just look over the first 10 days, what you see is there's a huge variance. You get the, 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 the observed value estimate for opportunities in males is basically seven times the value you get when you observe long enough. So as you observe more and more and more, more individuals mate, and your opportunity for selection decreases. It decreases initially faster in males and then slower in females. But the point is, what you're seeing here is that one over P phenomenon. Early on, very few individuals mate, one over P is large. As you go longer and longer, P gets larger, and you basically come down to this value here. And the value one isn't the actual value. One basically is the value you have at equilibrium. So this value might be 0.6. So this means that this value here is you know, something, something like that. So you can get these effects by looking at a short window if you score the data, the data is binary. Survive, don't survive, mate, don't mate. It basically means your opportunity for selection is a function of that mating or survival probability that will change as your window changes. So it's no longer kind of this independent arbitrary measurement. It depends upon your, your window size. The other way that can come up is random mating. So if you assume random mating follows a Poisson distribution, recall for a Poisson, the mean and the variance equal each other. So the variance divided by the mean squared just gives you 1 over W bar. 
So if you're looking at a window and the mean population fitness changes over time, remember mean population fitness is independent of variance in fitness, then if I look at a, so for example, the hypothetical example here is I've got 100 males, if only five females mate, then the average mating success is 5%, and this be, basically becomes 1 over 0 0.05, but if 50 females mate, the average mating success goes up to 50%. There's no intrinsic difference in this population, except the number of females goes up. And again, this is one of these uh, issues where the, the measurement of I is no longer independent of W bar. Same thing over here, that's basically W bar. So you want a measurement of I that's independent of W bar, otherwise as W bar changes, independent of the spread about that W bar, your opportunity for selection is going to change. So that's one of the, those caveats for using opportunity for selection are you have to have consistent measures. The time interval you look at can matter. If you're scoring matings, as your time interval gets larger, I is going to decrease because your p-value there is a successful mating. As you look over a longer window, more individuals mate, p becomes larger. If you're looking at viability, in a short window, most individuals survive, P is large, as you look over longer time, individuals die off, P gets smaller. So under mating, I is going to decrease over time. Under viability selection, I is going to increase over time. So again, you've got to be careful about how you use it so you get consistent measurements. But it's still a very useful measurement in terms of bounding the opportunity, bounding the selection intensity, and so it's a very powerful approach. Again, it's a trait independent way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. You can do that, but in a sense, this is kind of what, this is kind of doing that for you. This is comparable correction, because this would look at, look at for example, long-term survivability. So initially, this is very close to one. As it gets larger, you inflate the value. So that fall-off doesn't tell you that much about it. And you might ask, well, maybe I can use a sample to estimate that fall-off is going to be. That's approximate. You might as well measure as much data as you can. And the basic idea is you want to look at the biological window. So all mating before the individuals die, that's your realistic measurement. Anything else is a, is a biased measurement of that. So you want to look at that. So questions about opportunity for selection. It's a trait independent measure that simply takes variance in fitness data and allows you to ask questions about um, which population is under stronger selection and allows you to bound the strength of selection you can get on specific, the change you can get on specific traits. You have caveats in using it, but it's still a good measure to know about. So the next topic is sexual selection. And this is a topic that, that always gets really interesting because the, the, the ongoing debate is whether sexual selection may be stronger than natural selection. How do you measure it? Which sex is under stronger sexual selection? And so let's kind of give an overview here. Sexual selection occurs not, so the idea behind sexual selection is that mate choice, either through male-male competition for mates and or through female choice and for other features we'll talk about. So individuals differ in the number of mates they have. Is it the case the variance in mating success, if it translates into variance in offspring number, then sexual selection has occurred. And in some sense, it kind of always occurs in that if you don't mate, individuals that mate have more offspring than you. So the question is, is, is there a character-specific feature about that? So this was originally proposed by Darwin in Origins and more fully examined in The Descent of Man and Suction with a Relationship to Sex. And it was proposed as an explanation for unusual features. So, bird of paradise, lucking behavior. So lucking behavior is kind of like a bar where you know the, the males get all preened up and the female sits in an area and goes, nope, 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 maybe, nope. Um, and then elaborate what are called weapons and ornamentations. And these typically aren't used to fend off predators but are used for male-male competition. So for example, if you look at rhinoceros beetles, those longhorns aren't used to fight off 
birds, they used to flip over other males. So they lose and get access to females. So the idea is, how do some of these unusual traits and unusual behaviors evolve, which at first sight seem to be kind of counterintuitive with respect to survivability? And the explanation from Darwin was, well, these traits are there for competition for mates. If you can get more mates, even if you might have lower survivability, you may be able to more than counter that by having more mates. So the whole idea about sexual selection for uh, traits in general is quite interesting, but this is a biased view. This is kind of what people think about when they think about sexual selection. Animals. That's sexual selection too. Because what is it? Well, how do you get a mate as a flower? You attract a pollinator for, you know, things that aren't wind pollinators. So a lot of botanists have argued that a lot of the variation in floral shape you see is actually the result of sexual selection for pollen dissemination, which is also another way of saying mating success. So we can basically break sexual selection down into pre-mating selection, and it's often called pre-copulatory selection, something that doesn't make sense for plants, so we'll talk about pre-mating selection. And you can have post-mating selection, or post copulatory Now, Darwin, it's fun to, to look at the sort of um, cultural and historical aspects in uh, the whole uh, sexual sexual literature. Darwin considered females essentially monogamous, uh -huh, and because of that, he never considered post copulatory selection. So, for example, sperm competition is an example of that. We'll, we'll see examples of this in a second. But my favorite line, uh, the botanist Moore and Pinnell were doing something else, had this great line that Darwin assumed sexual selection was mainly restricted to animals because organisms outside of animals, quote, could surely not appreciate each other's beauty. I just love the phrase reading that. But as we mentioned, you know, that's very beautiful, but this is for attracting suites of pollinators. That's essentially sexual selection. So the view of sexual selection originally started out by, you know, big things with brains that made decisions about mate choice or not mate choice, and then moved on to more general things about general features that improve your ability to get mates. You don't have to involve any behavioral traits at all or any fighting traits. Here you're basically fighting for pollinators. Um, so pre-mating selection can be intersexual, intersexual, male versus male or female versus female competition for mates, or uh, intersexual, female choice of mates, or more rarely, male choice of mates. Post-mating selection occurs when the female has mated multiple times. Here's a great example of that. Pollen growth tubes in plants. People don't, you know, sexual selection is thought about in plants, but it's a system where it's literally occurring all the time. You think about how um, an angiosperm works, you have a pollen tube that lands on the stigma, and number one, if it's self-incompatibility, it may not grow at all. Number two, if it does grow, you've got a race. So the female, in a sense, has been mated in that receptive pollen has landed, and the pollen tubes grow, and whoever gets to the ovule first wins. That's massive selection potential, yet it's very rarely talked about. So people focus a lot on sperm competition, so, for example, in a lot of butterflies, you have something called a spermatophore. When a male mates, he puts a sperm package in. That sperm package basically becomes a single structure. And then if a male subsequently mates after that, some males have on their adiegus, the fancy Latin word for penis, a barb structure that goes in and basically disrupts any previous spermatophores. You also can have flies that are mated multiple times. Usually, last in is first out sperm. So under multiple mating, you can have lots of competition that goes on after mating has occurred between sperm. Another example of this, if you broadcast sperm into the water column, sperm then gets, gets basically drawn to, by typically pheromones, to floating eggs as well. You can have sperm competition for who goes in the micropel first. So I think um, post-mating competition has been under underappreciated especially in plants where you can basically have this. So sperm competition, or more generally gamete competition, 
donation from several males within a given female, and there may be features, some sperm may swim faster, there may be features, and if there are variants, there would be selection then for sperm that can outcompete other sperm. You can also have cryptic female choice, which is preferential selection of male gametes by females. Here, these are male gametes competing within the female. Here is the female preferring male gametes. An example of that would be self incompatibility systems. If a pollen grain lands on here and it has a different type from the female, the female will reject that. So the female, in some sense, a decision is being made on what type of pollen is, is accepted. And just to compute this uh, notion of the importance of pollen to a final time, about 50% of the plant genome is expressed during pollen tube growth. So there's huge potential for pollen competition, which could really set things. And a lot of those would be physiological traits, not necessarily morphological. Sure. Right, but I think too that, that I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe in, in dragonflies they don't make a spermatophore. They individually, as each egg comes out, they fertilize it. That could be the biggest metaphor. Okay. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Rips it out. Yeah. So people see, by the way, uh, dragonflies laying eggs. It's really cool because you see these dragonflies connected and the, fem the male's grabbing on the females, the female lays eggs as she goes across the pond or something. So, yeah, they're, 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 I, I'm, I'm, I'm expressing this as binary. Biology is not binary. So you can talk about components of these, right? So you can talk about, so you can talk about a covariance between the sexes for competition. That's certainly in that category. So basically, anything that has to do with mating and fertilization that results in variation in offspring number, you can lump under sexual selection. And the main push I want to basically park here is that people typically think about animals in terms of sexual selection, and I think plants are very underappreciated. So a lot of the thoughts initially about the role of sexual selection, go back to this picture by Bateman. He's like an Angus, doesn't he? And this, the interesting thing is, um, this paper was, uh, when was the paper? It was, I forget the date, it was like in 19, no, 1948. And what I had heard, I think Steve Arnold told me this, was that um, the paper was rediscovered by Trivers. Trivers is a really interesting figure who kind of started sociobiology. And it's a really interesting idea about, uh, you know, politics and science. Trivers was basically kicked out of Harvard because the communist professors there, and I'm using that term strictly because Dick Lewinton and, and Levin were proud, avowed communists, thought that sociobiology, trying to use evolution discovery, didn't fit in with their political beliefs, and therefore he shouldn't teach on campus. So political correctness and politics and science can be really interesting. But Trivis was one of the early people who talked about parent-offspring conflict and a bunch of other issues in that nature. And he was the one that made this paper famous. But apparently, the story goes, Ernst Meyer, the famous systematic biologist, wrote, you know, very classic book on systematics, was the one that pointed this paper out to him. And Bateman was looking at Drosophila. And in Drosophila, he made several observations, which were called Bateman's rules. And these observations were later modified by Arnold and, and other people. But let's talk about the initial version of Bateman's rules about sexual selection. So number one, males show greater variance in the number of offspring than females. So his observation in Drosophila is if you look at Drosophila males and look at the number of offspring they produce, there's a variance. And very often that variance is because a fraction of males don't mate at all, and therefore have no offspring, whereas essentially all females mate. And therefore the variance among females in number of offspring is less than variance among males. This was his observation. We'll come back and talk about these points. Number two, males have a greater variance in number of mates than do females. Essentially, all females mate. Some fraction of males don't mate at all. Some fraction of males mate multiple times. 
And then finally, and here's the key part, the total number of offspring in males is an increasing function of the number of mates, but largely independent of the number of mates in females. Again, these were the original observations which will modify substantially, and the idea here was that as males, as you mate more and more and more, you have more offspring, but females, one male is often enough to give her enough sperm to fertilize all her eggs. So those were the original things of Bateman's, and people are probably getting a little bit chafy about some of these, so let's kind of deconstruct those and see what the current way to express this is. So this was based on principles. Patty Gowani basically showed that Batesman's experiments had a critical flaw in the markers used uh, reduced viability, which basically made a, a systematic bias in estimation by sex. So the, the Bateman kind of set some basic ideas, and those ideas have been modified to make them a bit more gender neutral and look at more broad situations. Um, so Arnold basically framed uh, Bateman's things in 1994. Males showed, I just basically expressed what those were. And the essence of Bateman's observation was female fitness is not increased by additive matings, while male fitness is. And the key feature about sexual selection is this third thing. If variance in number of mates does not influence number of offspring, there's no sexual selection. So you have to have a couple things happening. Number one, variance in number of mates. Number two, variance in offspring. And number three, a connection where more mates equals more offspring. So let's, again, unpack that a bit. So Steve Arnold and a student of his, Adam Jones, had a number of papers um, where they restated Bateman's uh, point in a more gender neutral way. And basically, the sex experiencing the strongest sexual selection has a higher variance in reproductive success. The sex experiencing the strongest sexual selection has a higher variance in mating success. And most importantly, the slope of reproductive success on mating success. I do a regression. How many times you mate, reproductive success, that slope, the regression of that slope is larger for the sex experiencing the stronger sexual selection. And in fact, you don't even have to frame this in terms of asking which sex is experiencing stronger sexual selection. You can simply frame this into how much sexual selection is each sex experiencing. This thing here leads to something called Bateman gradients after Bateman, which are a way to quantify that. We'll talk about some examples of those in a second. So again, I said here, it needs to be stressed that neither or both sexes could be ex experiencing sexual selection. If I go back in here, variance in reproductive success, you can talk about an opportunity for selection based upon reproductive success. You can talk about an opportunity for selection based upon mating success. Neither one of these by themselves are a sufficient metric for sexual selection. Just because there's a significant variance in mating success does not mean that sexual selection is occurring. You need the connection that more mating equals more offspring. That's a connection that needs to be made. And Bateman's original argument was that if you have a female Drosophila and she mates four or five or six times, she still has the same number of offspring, roughly speaking, because one mating gives enough sperm to fertilize everything. Whereas males, if they mate multiple times, inseminate more females and therefore have more offspring. So in Drosophila, he argued, there's a direct connection between males, as they have more matings, have more offspring, where females, if they have more matings, don't necessarily have more offspring. Now there's a huge number of exceptions to all those patterns, and that's why Bateman's rules were kind of regarded as outdated, but it was an initial statement of some of the issues we need to consider. So what are some of the potential metrics then for sexual selection? Well, again, you can look at this opportunity for sexual selection. This is variance in mating success. This is just the opportunity for selection where I'm using mating success. Um, you can write this in relative mating success. One of the reasons this metric is a little problematic, and Arnold didn't propose it this way, but some workers interpret if this opportunity is there, that there is sexual selection. 
That's not correct. This, an opportunity means just that. If this is small, there's essentially no opportunity for sexual selection. If that is large, there is an opportunity, but not necessarily sexual selection. This is a necessary, but not sufficient. So a large value of this variance in mating success is necessary, but not sufficient for sexual selection. People have also tried to get other metrics for this, and the other metrics were proposed because what you want to do is look at some sort of null model, right? What do I expect the variance to be if mating is entirely random? If the chance of mating is 40%, I'm going to have a variance in mating success even if every individual has the same intrinsic chance of mating. So two metrics you occasionally see are this first index here and then this resource monopolization index. And the idea behind both of these is they basically standardize it so it gives you some idea about what you would expect if the mating process was entirely random. So you occasionally see these metrics in the literature as well in addition to this because you can get a large value for this if there's simply a tiny chance of mating by chance that generates kind of a large variance. So again, this looks at that first component, oh, sorry, the second component, um, do I have variance in mating success? It could entirely be random, but do I have that? The second issue that people have pointed out is you want to look at the what's called the operational sex ratio. So let's imagine, so I don't have HR get mad at me, that we're all beetles. And there's male and female beetles here. So I could look around and say the sex ratio is 50-50. But what fraction of the male beetles are mating? What fraction of the female beetles are mating? That's the operational sex ratio. So people suggest that you want both metrics. A male-biased operational sex ratio offers the possibility of sexual suction on males. There are more males than females. A female bias offers the opportunity for sexual suction on females. So this is another part to consider. You could have a large variance in mating success. It could entirely be a function of a skewed operational sex ratio. So an example, here's the famous marbled salamander. And we have these different metrics, operational sex ratio, uh, Morsati's index, Green's in index, and uh, they contain information to better inform uh, an ecologist, but the advantage of, of the opportunity for mating success is it bounds the opportunity for sexual selection. So the key feature here is a lot of the discussion is which of these is the better metric, and it really depends upon the question. So um, when looking at molted salamanders, what these workers here, Crosswell noted, was that while this opportunity for sexual selection is variance in mating success was a natural measure of sexual selection potential, it should always be contrasted with the null model. They observed high values for reproductive success and mating success, but only the reproductive success was significantly greater than expected under the null model. So all the variance in here in mating male success was simply due to random noise. The key feature that shows whether or not I have sexual selection and how strong it is, is this notion called the Bateman gradient. And Arnold originally looked at this relationship here. He did a regression on the reproductive success of a given sex as a function of the number of mates that sex had. So I simply take data. You've made it once, you've made it twice, you've made it not at all, you've made it twice. They look at number of offspring for each of those and simply do a regression. And the slope of that regression there, they originally called the sexual selection gradient. That indicates the potential for sexual selection because basically if that is there, it mean, and positive, if you have more mates, you have more offspring. An example, by the way, where you could get a female situation is think about mantids. A, air quotes, successful male mantid mates once and then he's dinner. If a female has multiple mates, she has lots of meals and therefore may have more nutrition to have more eggs 
And in that case, this would be energetic coefficients for reproductive success would go for the number of matings. So this was originally called the sexual selection gradient, but then Anderson came in and called the term Bateman gradient, and that term is kind of stuck, and there's all sorts of modifications. Someone asked about parthenogenesis. Um, the book talks about uh, when you have parthenogenic, you have a Bateman gradient of, of gamete production on females, uh, sorry, of sperm production on females, sperm production on male reproductive success, covariance between those. But you take this idea and have different regressions. So for uh, 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 um, outcrossers, non-hermaphrodites, that is dioecious organisms, you basically have male, male, female, female, and then you have different combinations. The book talks about those when you've got, got hermaphrodites. So let's look at some examples of these. Here's a little rough skin me. So cute. What you have here is the males are the diamonds, uh, and the females are the filled circles. So here's that regression for females. So you see a trend as you have more mates, you have increased um, number of offspring, but the slope is kind of low. If you look at males, you see all females have reproduced. Uh, uh, a, couple, a couple of males have not reproduced. One male in this case has not reproduced. But the regression of those that are reproduced on reproductive fitness gives you a much stronger slope. So Bateman gradient here for females is statistically not different from zero. The Bateman gradient for males is statistically different from zero. So from that criteria, there's more selection on males than on females. If you go to the lovely bankful, there it is, again, really cute. This is a nice study because what they looked at, dashed lines are females, solid lines are males. They looked at different operational sex ratios. They wanted to ask, does this change over operational sex ratios? And they saw for females, it didn't. For males, so the gradient was flat in females. As you had more mates, you had the same number of offspring. In males, as you had more mates, you had more offspring. And it, the, the strength of that depended to some extent on the operational sex ratio. Chipmunks are a different story. So these are, I think these are measured in Quebec, so they're French speaking. So what you see here is males are the open circles, females are the solid circles. It's basically no difference. So for both males and females, as you have more mates, you have more offspring. So those are examples of Bateman gradients which are out there. This gradient and that gradient conform to Bateman's original observations of male mating success translating into more offspring, female mating success not translating to more offspring, whereas the chipmunk example shows that both male and female mating success translate directly into more offspring. So this is an example where Bateman's principles didn't hold, but Bateman's principles were for Drosophila and give you a framework to think about how sexual selection may or may not operate. So questions so far. We've talked about sexual selection, and it involves three components, variance in mating success, variance in reproductive success, and the key notion is those two are connected. Variance in mating success directly leads to variance in reproductive success. Bateman gradients quantify that last criteria. People have proposed different metrics for looking at variance in mating success, opportunity for selection, other metrics have been proposed that try to account for randomness generating a variance. So you could basically try to control for that and ask if you see mating this above, more, more spread out than you expect by chance. Yeah. Don't make for what? Um, no, so this is, this is pre-mating. But you can take that idea and then extend it, right? You can take the basic logic and ask, how would I extend that to post-mating? How would I extend that to competition of pollen tubes growing down? Right, so, but mainly, these observations were largely built upon animals, and the focus is all largely pre-mating. Other questions or comments? Question, by the way. Good comment, I should say. Okay. So these slopes that you see on these Bateman gradients can have a couple of different forms. 
And Steve said, number one, you could have single mating saturation. This is how we think many insects may have. That is, if a female has a single mate, that's usually enough to fertilize all her eggs. So additional mates may not result in more offspring. Um, secondly, you could have a linear relationship. The more mates you have, the more offspring you have. Third, you could have diminishing returns. That is, as you get more mates, you have more offspring, but it falls off. So there's not really much of an advantage. Yes, there's a small advantage, but that may be then countered. Then you can get an intermediate optimum, whereby the work of getting all those extra mates may lead to more offspring, but you also may put yourself at risk for viability effects. And in those cases, you get an intermediate optimum. Usually, we can't distinguish these because these require lots of observations beyond having zero or one matings. These nonlinear terms require lots of data on two, three, and four matings, and usually that's not available, so we really can't distinguish that these occur. Furthermore, these would only be important if some fraction of the population does indeed get more than, let's say, two mates. So let's try to connect some of these things. Um, a composite measure for potential sexual selection is the Jones index. And let's go ahead and show Adam. So there's Adam, did a lot of work with Steve. And so the Jones index basically tries to quantify these relationships that in order to have variance in reproductive success, we need variance in mating success and a connection between those two. You can have lots of variance in reproductive success, lots of variance in mating success, but if one doesn't lead to the other, then you don't have sexual selection. So he proposed an index, which other people call the Jones index, right? You never name an index after you. Um, so uh, what the, he basically showed was if you take the sexual selection gradient and the opportunity for selection. So for example, in males, this would be the variance in male mating success and the regression on male mating success and fitness. This then gives you the potential for sexual selection. Why? You can have a relationship where more mating leads to higher reproductive success, but if everybody mates the same, that's not realized. So you need that relationship where higher variance in mating success translates into higher offspring numbers, and you also then need to have variance in number of mating successes. You can then use this to show the Jones index, just like the opportunity for selection, bounds the amount that a trait can change under sexual selection. So this, so this by itself isn't sufficient, that will, will bound it, but you also then have to look at the connection that is by this. So for example, if the sexual selection gradient is zero, no matter how big this is, you're not gonna get any change in the characters from sexual selection. That's kind of the key. So one of the interesting things was someone then asked, which is a better metric for sexual selection. What they did was they took five different species, a large and a small mammal, a bird, a beetle, and a fish, which had good data, and based upon these parameters, they generated 500 biologically possible mating systems, and then examined the correlation between measures of the potential and the actual strength. The actual strength basically from the simulated mating data. And what they showed of all these metrics Bateman gradient, opportunity for selection, Jones index, that's Morissotti's index, that's Green's monopoly index, that the Bateman measure and the variance in male mating success, while still correlated, perform the poorest. These two metrics here, the Morissotti and the Green index, had intermediate, but by far the best and most consistent measure was the Jones index. So the Jones index was the one that basically gave you the best signal for sexual selection because it puts the two pieces together, variance in mating success and connection between mating success and variance in reproduction. You can go a little bit further and you can ask what that opportunity for selection on a given character should be. Remember we had that expression where the correlation between trait value and fitness times the opportunity for selection gave you the intensity for that character. We can do a similar sort of thing here. This is called the Jones mating differential. This is basically 
the Robertson price equation and it asks for the correlation between your trait, standardized, so it's got a variance of one, and standardized mating success. And the connection is the, the expected change on a trait equals the Bateman gradient times this correlation between absolute between relative mating success and the trait value. Okay. And that's kind of your quick introduction to this very broad, very messy, very contentious field called sexual selection. In some sense, it's, con it's a bit contentious because people often project views of gender on that. And so, for example, Joan Roughgarden had a really controversial paper where she basically said, you got to throw everything out because it's all based upon current norms of how we view gender. I should mention that Joan Roughgarden, you might know her as John Roughgarden. Jonathan Roughgarden wrote a very important book on uh, a theory of population genetics and ecology. So they obviously have a worldview that's been shaped by their own experience. And they argue that that view that others have shaped how people looked at sexual selection. The problem is you then had 95 people of all genders write a big nasty letter back to it. And the book talks a little bit about that controversy. But it just points out that, that when people can take an idea and then infer something about what it says, either confirming or against their politics, rightly or wrongly, that idea gets a bit distorted and tensions get overexcited when in fact we're just simply looking at sexual selection as measurements of variance in mating success and what that has to do with number of offspring. So big field, huge field. One of the big things we thought about in the book was we could usually have five or six chapters on sexual selection. We decided just to basically have a little section where we talked about its measurement in terms of relative fitness. So key concepts, Bateman's original rules, the generalization of them that shows you have to have variance in mating success, you have to have variance in reproductive success, and most importantly, those must be connected. Bateman gradients connect those. We can compute those for each sex. We can compute those for hermaphrodites. A little more complicated, you have to worry about male on male offspring, male on female offspring, et cetera. We, we can do those. We then had different metrics for variance in mating success, the opportunity for mating success, and then these Morrisani and Green indices, which kind of standardize for variance created by random factors. And uh, then we had the Jones index and the Jones differential, which is probably the cleanest index because it puts together the pieces we want. That relationship between mating success and reproduction and that variance in number of males or number of mates. So questions about variance in fitness or sexual selection? <coughs> Yeah. That's fine. Good point to discuss then. Sure. That's a great question. Yeah, so so that's that's actually an interesting point. So if you have multiple copulations of the same individual, does that give you increased reproductive success? You could actually build that into here. You would probably have to do it hierarchically in contrasting number of, so you could basically, what you do is do a Bateman gradient on an individual pair basis and on a population basis. The individual pair basis would be if you look at the same pair, if they have, as the number of matings for that pair increases, does the reproductive success of that pair increase? That would address your issue. Then you could also look at as an individual gets different individuals to mate, does a reproductive success vary? And you could frame those both into this framework. That'd give you kind of a hierarchical model, and you, you could actually look at that. I don't, but this is such a huge literature, I'm not the person to ask about this. I gave, you know, I, I think I gave 15 or 20 general overview references, but this is a massive field. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure people have done that. It's certainly the case in humans and higher primates, right? That if a pair has more matings, they're going to have more offspring over an extended window, obviously. That's, that's why, I, I mean, I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure that people have not done that. That's how I would do that. There might be better ways, but that's at least my initial approach to think about that. But it's a good point because, I mean, you know, again, 
we often present biology as kind of being a binary choice, like species A and species B. Biology is a blur and a grade. And the reason it looks binary is often we only sample little pieces of that space, so we see black and white, we miss that gray scheme in the middle. As we sample that space more fully, we see that it's a continuum, a blob, a heat map of different combinations. And certainly the idea about multiple mates between couples and multiple mates with different individuals, those could all impact reproductive success. Certainly true. I mean, there are massive books written on this. In fact, it's funny, um, one of the more popular books about 15 years ago was a book called Sexual Strategies. And it was basically about, you know, how insects pick mates. But because the term sexual strategies, it was a big hit on, I think, Amazon and sold a lot of copies. And people were kind of disappointed. It's like, oh, man. Bummer. Sure. Okay, uh-huh. Right. Sure. Not necessarily, because basically, I mean, the idea is, are you getting a random sample? And so if you, look within, if you only look within a family, what you could be seeing, if that family uh, shares genes for higher fitness, then their variance will be depressed. So you, if you want to look at, again, the hierarchical model approach, would be you could look at between and within generation, between and within family variance in that. But you always have to ask what the broad question is. And the broad question is one of two flavors. Question number one, what these lectures here, these last six lectures are talking about, is the ecological question of how do I ask whether specific traits are under natural or sexual selection? The evolutionary question, Ari Fisher had a great line, natural selection is not evolution. Evolution requires that, that within generation change have a heritable component that's passed across generations. And so the type of question you ask, the type of data you gather, very often depends upon whether you're interested if selection is acting on a trait or that trait will respond to selection. There's overlap there, but sometimes you use different tools. So for example, if you're asking, let's say, insect phenology, and you're asking, is insect phenology under selection pressure due to climate change? That's one issue. The second issue is, can insect phenology evolve to keep pace with climate change? That requires the first information for the first, but it also requires information on genetics. And so look at, when you're looking at fitnesses within families, you're kind of confounding measurements of fitness with transmission. And so what question you ask depends upon how you look at that data. So the topic I won't talk about is looking at the response to selection. See chapters 13 through 20 in the book, talk about that. I might mention a little bit, um, if you're interested in natural populations, a chapter I won't talk about that's quite relevant is chapter 20, which is all the attempts to predict selection response in natural populations. The bottom line, it doesn't work well. You can have a trait that shows highly significant selection. The within generation change is dramatic and significant, Number two, the trait is highly heritable. Classic example, red deer antler size. If you got big old honking antlers, and the cool thing is they shed antlers every year, so you can actually pick them up, assign them to an individual, and measure them very precisely. If you've got big antlers, there's a very clear, strong trend you get more mates. Unambiguous. Number two, big antlers are unambiguously heritable. No question about that. Parent offspring regressions are quite significant. So what happens to antler size? It's gone down over time. What's going on? And one of the explanations is a hidden character. Your ability to get mates may be a function of how good a fighter you are. You might think of how good a fighter you are is a function of your antler size, but it could also be a function of your antler size and your nutritional, your energy level. That would be an environmental component that would contribute to antler size, but that environmental component wouldn't be passed on from parent to offspring. 
So if the most energetic individuals are the ones that have higher fitness, they also would have bigger antlers, but it's all based upon the environmental component of antler size. And therefore, none of that response is passed on. So an issue we're gonna grapple with in the last couple of lectures is how do we actually determine the target of selection? And one way is to basically ask if the predicted response is consistent with within generation change, because within generation change can confound a trait I haven't measured that's correlated with both fitness and your trait, whereas the cross-generation change doesn't confound that. So that's something we'll come back to. Yes. Or if the trait itself is directly under selection, that generates the genetic correlation between the trait and fitness as well. But it's really interesting. I mean, the bottom line is all these elaborate studies, in fact, let me just, since I have half a second here, let me just pull up, give you a little, a little sneak preview. So here is chapter 20. And if you look, there's a table I borrowed from several different publications putting it together. And talking there about ways to get around that, mainly using this methodology called mixed models. Give me a second here. See all that fun stuff in there? Isn't that neat? Where is that? It's almost. It's like a page long table. I'm surprised I didn't see it passing over. But it's. Okay, here we go. Results. So we're halfway through the chapters. Give you some idea. It's a pretty big chapter. I'm sorry, this is rather inefficient. I'll try to get, get to it fairly quickly. But almost. Almost there. Okay, here we go. So here's a table of a large number of studies. Ah, sorry, I mean to get get too well. Right, actually, you, you can still be. You know, let me go back to one page. I'm trying to enlarge the page and not do that. So these are long studies. This column over here is duration in terms of years. So here's antler mass in red deer. So this is heritability. This is the, op the, the S in standard deviations. Those are both highly significant. The result is you go the opposite direction. No change, no change, no change, no change. Hey, bighorn sheep, it works. Red squirrel, it works. Body mass, opposite direction. Opposite, 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 opposite. As expected, opposite, no change. So the breeder's equation, R equals H squared S, does a terrible job in natural populations. And it's not because H is wrong. It's because in many of these cases, even though a trait changes, that trait is not the target of selection. There's some other feature that's the target of selection. And we'll talk a little bit about that last couple lectures. We talked about multiple traits. Okay. Other questions or comments?